Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Jesus said, unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Sometimes we're called to do a significant work and live long throughout our lifetime. But there are rare occasions when, uh, when somebody shows that they're willing to die for a cause has greater impact and influence on the world than somebody who just passes on uh, from old age after doing a long extended great work. Uh, and that's a little bit terrifying sometimes to us as believers. But you have to see the promised land. You have to recognize some things that Dr. Martin Luther King recognizes. I talk about dreams. Let's look at three principles that we can learn from, from this man that will help us with our own dreams. Number one, you must find your dream on the mountain. And you have to see the promised land. Your dream is not your decision. It's your discovery. Uh, in Jeremiah 29, 11, if you put that up, we'll read that very quickly. It says, let me read this translation. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. In my translation, which I think is old King James, it says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, that you may have a future and a hope, one translation says, or an expected end. God told Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb, and I ordained you at that time to be a prophet to the nations. You have to recognize that you're not an accident in the earth, that if you're a believer, you were born for a purpose. That you carry something from heaven into the earth and you are a steward of that calling. And that to run from the calling is the most foolish thing that you could do. And it doesn't have to be a five-fold ministry calling. I mean, somebody's called to clean the sanctuary. And if they do it with all their heart, they'll receive the reward of being obedient to the heavenly calling. So we have different levels, but we're all called to do something. And I believe that, you know, that if we're faithful in little things, God promotes us to greater things as far as our significance is concerned. So we have to define ourselves in the light of why we were born. You have to know who you are in God. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King obviously knew exactly what he was called to do, what his role was in, his earth, in the earth. And uh, he was motivated, and he wasn't intimidated by the cost that it might, you know, the counting the cost of his purpose and his destiny. So we have to learn to define ourselves on the mountain, see the promised land, recognize the reward of whatever it is that God is calling us to do. We have to understand our own significance by the Spirit. God has to drop something into our spirit to deliver us from the, well, I'm only me. What could I do? Well, no, you're, you are only you with the living God who created the universe inside of you, right? So we have to get rid of that sense of insignificance and see ourselves in the, through the lenses of God, through the lenses of faith. And also, if need be, we must be willing to back, pass the baton to another person. I think... After all that Martin Luther King Jr. did to fulfill his destiny, he still didn't get to the voila moment, right? Uh, and he was okay with the fact that God gave him a glimpse of the fulfillment of his dream in the spirit, but he didn't see it in the natural. There are a lot of missionaries that have gone overseas and they've gone into places that are very primitive, Borneo and various elements, and they went in and they toiled and they built and they plowed and they never saw the outpouring. They never saw the mass revivals for the people that they prayed with for 60 years before they went home to be with Jesus, right? But other missionaries came in behind them and entered into their labor and they were able to fulfill 
the planting and the harvesting because of the flowers that went before them. And so Martin Luther King is, in, is the part of the great cloud of witnesses that is in the grandstand of heaven seeing the foundations that he laid and what we are all building upon those foundations to continue to carry the baton that he passes to us, right? So we have to be willing, if we have a dream, to recognize I might not see the full ultimate revelation of its fulfillment, but I know it's, I'm going to make a, distance, a, a difference, and I'm willing to pass the baton to the next generation. These kids that were up here are being tremendously influenced by what's happening here, and they will continue to carry the message and the baton that we hand to them. Amen? Amen. Someone said, you don't even know what you're alive for until you know what you would be willing to die for. That's an interesting statement, but there's only two things that really motivate us in life, and that's pain or passion. And God is willing to use either one of them to move you forward. I've been inspired by pain to move closer to God when I was a little bit too flippant about my calling and my destiny. But when I got a glimpse of the promised land, then I was motivated by the passion of what possibly could be in God. It's better to be motivated by passion. Uh, you know, a lot of people will come to Jesus because some fiery preacher said you're all sinners in the hands of an angry God right and we're like oh my God and we run to the altar but you know that can't sustain you that can't hold you in the things of God that might be an impetus for you to jump out of the frying pan right but it won't keep you passionate about God your relationship with him and your calling so sometimes God will use some difficult situations to give us a launch, but then we have to connect with our calling because in it is our passion, right? You have to have God's blueprint for your life. We talked about Jeremiah 29, 11. There is a blueprint. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Therefore, your assignment is not your decision, but your discovery. It has to come by revelation. When I was meditating on this, I heard... A little tag on the end of it it's not your decision it's your discovery but your discovery becomes your recovery which basically means that everything you've dreamed about and all of the junk you're trying to get off you all of the depression that you might be dealing with is the recovery that's that that comes from your discovery you know the Isaiah 58 principle as you stretch forth your hand of the afflicted then your light breaks forth. You discover what you're called to do. You get into your destiny and all of a sudden passion is like a fire that burns up the funk that's in your life, right? And all of a sudden you're excited about the abundant life that God promises. You have to define yourself. You must let God reveal to you your true purpose. A dream is like a pregnancy that is conceived in your times of intimacy with God. You know, what the things that we see, they're natural, they have in the natural, they have their genesis in the spirit. So just like a natural pregnancy comes through intimacy, so intimacy with God will birth a revelation about something that God wants to do through you. And it doesn't immediately manifest, but you can feel, ooh, Something's going on in here. Something's growing in inside of me. I sense destiny. I sense purpose. But you have to guard it. You have to bring it to full term, and then you have to birth it. Then you have to care for it, right? You know, when my wife got pregnant, we were, I was a little bit shocked because I, I didn't see that coming. Uh, I'm, I'm glad it did come, but... The reality of it was is that we were living one way, and when she became pregnant, we had to start living another way, a different way. And if you're pregnant, sometimes it will demand you to change things that maybe you don't really want to change, but this is more important, right? You have to change your diet. You have to change, at some point, the clothes that you choose to wear. You have to begin to make preparations, you start dreaming about the fulfillment of the call or the dream or preparing for the dream's manifestation, right? Sometimes you can't even see it yet. The doctor told you that it's real, right? 
but you have no evidence other than maybe a little bit of morning sickness of some kind, but you're already going to the paint store, picking out pink paint for a bedroom or something to prepare for what you sure will come. Well, when God puts something in your spirit, we have to have that same sense of anticipation to prepare for something we are sure will come, even though there's no physical evidence yet. You understand? We begin to prepare for our dream. Another thing you do is like, you know, and I'm saying this in the natural, but maybe you're running with the wrong kind of people. Maybe you're clubbing. Maybe you're doing stuff. And then all of a sudden, oh, I got a dream, right? It might demand that you change certain associations. You know, when women get pregnant, they want to hang around either with women that are pregnant to talk about how it's going to be or talk with women who have had a number of babies so they can find out, okay, tell me about this. Is it hurt? And what, you know, what's going on? And they want information about the dream. You know, if, if you have a dream but you don't quite know how to develop it, find somebody that's living in the middle of their dream and hang around them and ask them how they got from here to here, right? So we want mentors that are living the dream so they can help us, so they can be midwives, if you will, for our dream. If you have a dream from God, your dream will have an enemy. To protect your dream, you must first articulate the vision because the enemy will bring confusion. Uh, everything the devil does initially is about identity. If he can confuse your identity, he can steal your dream. That's why when I read I Had a Dream by Martin Luther King, I thought, man, this guy knew exactly where he, he not only knew what to do, but he chose words that created the emotion that he was feeling for his dream so that you dreamed with him. It was amazing. We have to be able to articulate our dream. Habakkuk 2.2, if you'll put that up, we've heard this, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run that reads it. When you, when you write the vision, you create focus. A dream is just a dream until you write it down. Once you write it down, it becomes a goal. Once it becomes a goal, it becomes a point of focus for your energy, right? I don't believe God will give us an anointing for, I, I, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. I think he wants us to pray, find out, write it down, declare it, stare at it meditate on it. Joshua 1.8, if you put that up, it talks about meditating day and night that we may have good success. You literally have to build focus for the things that God has called you to do, right? Meditate means to mutter or to speak over and over. I am going to be a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to go around the world. And, you know, you, you may be working at Target, you know, but you see it inside, and so you declare it, you birth it, you meditate on it, you mutter it. Me, personally, I'm a visual learner, so when somebody gives me a prophetic word and says, you know, you're going to build a school, or you're going to teach, or I see seven books in you, right? I'm thinking, amen, and I meditate on those words. I speak them out loud, but because I'm a visual learner, I create imagery for it, and I put it in a book, and my confession is here, my imagery is here. He said, well, Tim, is that biblical? Well, let's look at Abraham, the father of faith. God told Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And wow, you know, when God tells you something, I mean, he didn't just get a prophetic word from prophet so-and-so. I mean, he's talking to a, a fiery pillar representing the very Shekinah of God. And God speaks, Abraham. I'm going to make you the father. Now, I don't know about you, but you would think that would be enough to be thoroughly persuaded, right? But he actually says to God, after God gives them this prophetic insight into his destiny, he said, well, how shall I know that this will be? Well, you'd think God would get frustrated with that. It's like, I just told you, right? But he's, he grabs the brother and he says, look, look at the stars. So shall your seed be in, in, in number, Right? So he gave him something to connect with visually, and we need to bombard our ear gates with our destiny and our eye gates with our destiny. Every time Abraham was tempted to doubt what he was called to do, he would lay down on his back to go to sleep at night and look up, and there would be the testimony of his destiny. He would see the stars. Imagery is powerful, right? 
Create imagery. Create vision boards for the things that God has called you to do and put it somewhere where you see it every day. Pin it up on, magnetize it up on the refrigerator, whatever it is that you need to do. Right next to the little sign on your refrigerator that says you're fasting. This is mine. (laughs) So you have to define yourself in God. Your dream has an enemy that you must protect. You must articulate the vision uh, because articulation creates energy and focus. The enemy of your dream is broken focus, right? You've all seen little garden nozzles, these stream spray ones that when you turn it to the left, it makes a fan spray. When you turn it back, it makes a stream spray. When I was a kid, we used to swim in my, my friend's pool And we had a little blue boat that we would put in the pool. And when we would get into the boat, we'd we'd put the hose into the pool and we'd turn it on all the way. And then we would turn this to a fan spray and put it behind the boat and the boat would propel around the pool, right? Which we really got in trouble for later because we completely overflowed the pool. (laughs) Filled it up with water beyond its capacity. But then we would go around. But when we wanted to go faster, we would turn it to a stream spray which concentrated the energy, and the boat took off. Now, there's an analogy in that. Fan spray covers more area with less energy. Stream spray covers more area, or excuse me, less area with more energy. What are you saying? What I'm saying is we may start off in ministry doing whatever our hands find to do and doing it with all our might. I've worn every hat that you can possibly wear in ministry except leading worship. And you should praise God for that because that would be awful. (laughs) But the reality of it is that at some point you need to begin to turn the nozzle to a place of intensity and focus, recognizing what the Apostle Paul recognized, this one thing I do. Because there is a principal thing that you have been called to do And energy or focus creates energy. And the more energy you have for the one thing, the more amazing and anointed it's going to be. So you have to define yourself, your specific calling. It doesn't mean if a brother calls you and says, I need help. Could you come help set up here? No, you go do that. I'm not saying, oh, no, I only do this. I am saying that there should be one emphasis of ministry. Most people have a major and a minor, and it's okay uh, to do the minor, but... You spend 80% of your time working on your, on your primary calling and 20% of your time uh, developing new skill sets and working on other elements. <clears throat> uh, anything birthed in the spirit cannot be accomplished in the flesh. Paul told the Galatians, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And the tendency sometimes is to get this radical spirit launch from God And then you land on your feet and you got this energy and then you try to figure out what do I do next? And then you get all up in your head and you start operating out of your soul and things start going flat and it doesn't seem to be amazing as it used to be. And you need to finish your call the way you started your call. You need to get with God, right? One of the things that I've noticed, imagine this being your brain, is that if you don't spend much time with God, you get hard and and it gets a little brittle. And and in the soul, that looks like edginess. And so sometimes Sandra and I will be having a a day where, you know, we're we're talking about bills, we're talking about issues and that sort of thing. And you can get, it, it can take you to a place where you're a little edgy, right? Now, we have the wisdom because of the experience of when we're edgy, we immediately go, did you pray today? Were you in the word today? And no, you know, and then, ah, you're edgy. Okay. We'll talk about this a little later after you spend some time in the Word, right? Because the presence of God is the oil that makes the machine or the motor run smooth, right? So we need to basically be renewed in the spirit of our mind or our brain. And that means that it requires some soaking time with God. Your brain has all of these areas that need to be filled up with God's glory And then you come out of your prayer closet dripping in the glory of God. And then you go to work and you leak all over your friends. (laughs) Right? 
because this is what you were created to do, steward the glory of God. But imagine I'm dealing with confusion and I'm dealing with irritation and that sort of thing. And at the same time, I'm supposed to be writing a book. It's like, I can't write a book. I'm distracted. I'm irritated. I don't want to write a book. I just want to watch TV. I get a little soaking time and I come out and the oil of God is massaging my creative thought processes. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm operating out of inspiration instead of trying to tool something out in the flesh. Your destiny demands this kind of daily experience. Um, you must be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4.23. You must endure the hard places and the dry seasons of your calling. Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Put up that image of uh, the picture of me with a picture of Jesus. When I was a young believer, I knew that God had called me to do something. But then when it took so long, I thought, this isn't fair. You know, you're dangling the carrot, but I never get to eat from it. And so I got angry at God, and I just like, I'm done. I'm done. You know, like kids throw a tantrum, and they look over the shoulder, and they're hoping that you're going to react in the way that they want. You know, it's manipulation. God's a little too smart for that, but I wasn't smart enough to not try it. So I'm like, I'm out of here, you know. And uh, I said, the only time I get peace anymore is when I go fishing. So I'm going fishing, right? And, uh, you know, we'll talk later. And so I'm driving, and I'm going up a, a dead-end road that dead ends up at Pyramid Lake. I'm going to Piru Creek, and I'm going to go fishing. This road has been abandoned because it goes nowhere. And I'm driving up the road, and I see a paper blowing on the side of the road. And I hear God say, go get that paper. And I'm like, oh, we, I'm not talking. You know, I don't even know why you're trying. You know my heart, my attitude. And God said, no, really, go get that paper. And so I just didn't say anything. I just kept driving. But the farther I drove, the woo, the funkier I, I started to feel. Uh, the fear of the Lord started to come on me, and I felt like somebody pulled a cork out of my heel, and all my life was draining out, and I better get that cork back in there right away. So I went, all right, all right, but I, like a teenager, all right, you know. <laughs> so I turned the car around, and I'm going back in the ditch, and I'm like, what, 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 where, what? And then I see this piece of paper, and I turn it over, and it's this. And there's a picture of, of an angry Jesus. <laughs> Not the little Jesus that's knocking on the door with a little lamb, you know, like, hey. No, it's a pissed off Jesus. <laughs> and he's looking at me, and it says on the paper, now think about this. I'm in the middle of the nowhere, and I'm having a bad day. Uh, I'm having a wrong moment. God tells me to get the paper. I go back. I pick it up. I turn it over. I said, I didn't tell you it was going to be easy. I only told you it was going to be worth it. Oh, man, it nailed me to the wall. I repented, I got right with God, and I was corrected, and Jesus purposely made himself look angry in that picture, <laughs> but I felt kept, I felt loved, I felt like God was not going to let me get off course. You know what kind of security that produces inside of you when something like that happens? So that's a trophy for me. I took my wife back to that spot, we had a little bit of a prayer time, and she took that photograph right at the spot where I found it as I told her the story. So that goes in my vision book. Because there would be times when I don't like this dry season. I don't like this hard place. I want to move on. You promised. God said, remember. Remember the encounter with me on Templin Highway. Right? <clears throat> so you have to endure the hard places. Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He saw the face of his bride on the other side of the cross. And it said, it's going to be worth it. Right? Be careful who you share your dream with. Joseph was sold into slavery for sharing his dream. Not everybody is going to get you. You understand that? People that you used to run with, now you have a dream. Hey, I'm, gonna, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a baby. Yeah, but you can go to Club Friday, right? They're constantly going to be trying to pull you away from a dream. People of low aspirations are intimidated by the call of God on your life, and they will try to arrest your development. Let God deal with your stuff. This is so important. We need healing encounters from God, not spiritual band-aids right? Your gifting will take you to where your character cannot keep you. Your character has to move forward at the same pace as your gifting, because if your gifting gets way out here, and you get the cheers of the people, oh, you're awesome, this, that, and the other, your character will falter with pride 
or with jealousy or all kinds of stupid stuff because you didn't build your character to keep pace with your gifting and your calling. Put up the uh, picture of the tree. I want to get this out because I didn't get it out. Is that tree up there? Awesome. Okay. I live in Granada Hills. I got huge eucalyptus trees on my property. And one day it rained really hard. And the next day it blew really hard. And look at this tree. The root ball was taller than me. It was, it was like almost eight feet around uh, or seven feet around at the base. An incredible tree. Houses all around me, only one narrow area where there was a field and it just happened to fall there. So I didn't know whether to be angry or to praise God, to be honest with you, because I didn't want the tree to fall over. But at least it didn't kill anybody because look at how close the house is next to me. What if it would have gone in that direction? Would have cut them in half? So this tree falls over and I'm upset because I got other trees that size on my property. So I call a tree guy. He comes over here and I said, why did this tree fall over? I mean, am I, do I have to worry about these other trees coming down? Because this is crazy. This is dangerous. This is potential death. I said, it could have fallen on my house. It would have reached. And he goes, no, I don't think you have anything to worry about these trees, these other trees. I said, well, why in the world did this tree fall down? And I, he said to me, he looked at me and he goes, because it was wounded when it was young. And all of a sudden, I started getting all these downloads from heaven, <laughs> right? Because God used that power statement to... I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but sometimes God can download a book in, in a megasecond. And you just, <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden you go, whoa, that'll preach, you know? And, but basically, this tree, if you look at the red arrow, you'll see a scar on the side of the tree. See that? When this tree was younger, it was probably hit by a tractor or something. But it didn't affect the tree, that it, it didn't kill the tree immediately. And what happens is the tree begins to grow up and get big and be obvious and, and gain influence. And the birds of the air come and land in its branches. And he builds a church, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, all these people are looking to you, right? But you never dealt with the wound that you received when you were young. And when the wind blows just right and when there's enough rain to loosen the soil, not only are you coming down, but everybody that trusted you is going to go down too. So we, before we launch into our ministry, we need to go to God candidly and say, I don't want the devil to come later to try to exploit a weakness that I never dealt with when I'm in high profile ministry, right? God, show me what I need to deal with, right? We all have to have a sozo moment with God regarding our stuff. And don't be ashamed if you got stuff, because we all got stuff, right? So protect your dream by giving God the opportunity to uh, shine a light on your stuff. He's not going to shine his light on everything in a second. It's more like dealing, pulling up layers of skin off an onion, one deal at a time. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to deal with this. The enemy has the capacity to align the planets. You know, a lot of men of God, they feel the pressure in ministry. And they think, oh, I can deal with this. I'm good. Maybe they feel a little bit more pressure. The gravitational pull of sin. No, I'm good. I know what I'm fighting for. You know, I got a great wife, I got a great family, I got a great ministry, I got whatever. But every once in a while, there's a season where all the planets line up and you experience a gravitational pull of every planet in its alignment and you are pulled in ways you never thought possible. And men fall in those seasons. And you have to hold in your scripture, he that thinks that he stands, let him take heed lest he falls. Because nobody is immune to that kind of pressure. It takes intimacy and walking in the spirit and developing a relationship with God that brings the spirit of self-control. Because the greater the influence that you have, the more effects you're going to have for the kingdom, but you're going to get the enemy's attention as well. That's all right. God compensates 
for new devils at new levels with new graces to be able to deal with that level, right? So it shouldn't intimidate us, but it should make us aware. We should walk circumspectly. You know, circumspection is like I'm aware of 360 degrees of my circumstance, and I'm not going to let anything sneak up on me, right? All right. We're all called to do something. The revelation of what you're called to do starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.